Are you living in anticipation of Christ's return? Are you excited about the fact that Jesus is coming back? And furthermore, you don't know when, <laughs> just to avoid a few possible pitfalls. This do, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we believed. Our salvation is nearer to us. That's a sort of puzzling statement in a way, isn't it? The time factor in this age is difficult to comprehend because Paul wrote as if the coming of the Lord was very close. I'll give you my personal understanding. This is not doctrine, this is just Brother Prince. And if it helps you, praise God. If it doesn't, don't get angry with me. But you see, there are some benefits in having been a philosopher. And one of the things that philosophers always ponder about is time. And time remains a mystery, even in spite of Einstein. Nobody has really plumbed the depths of what time is. But I want to suggest to you that when a true believer dies and passes out of this life, he passes into a timeless existence. Eternity is not subject to the laws of time. We are no longer having elapsed time. There are no clocks in that world that we go to. And his body is laid in the tomb and decomposes. So he closes his eyes in death, moves out into a timeless uh, existence, and his eyes are not going to open until when? the resurrection. <laughs> this blesses me so much, I hope it'll bless you. And when he opens those eyes in his resurrected body, what's the first thing he'll see? The Lord coming in power. So you are never further from the Lord's coming in time than you are from your point of death. You see what I'm saying? Because after that, there's not time for you. This excites me. I don't know whether it excites you, I've pondered on it a lot. It also excites me that when I open these eyes with a resurrected, glorified body, the first thing my eyes are going to look at is Jesus in his glory, in his power. If you're not excited about that, you should be a Britisher. <laughs> you know how excitable we are. <laughs> And I was, after all, brought up an Anglican, let me tell you that, too, an Episcopalian. <laughs> but I get excited when I think about the Lord's return. And that really is the thing that motivates me to live the Christian life. I'm going to see Jesus in his glory. I'm going to see his kingdom established on earth. That's the only solution to the innumerable problems of humanity. We can do a little bit of good, we can open hospitals, we can start schools, but evil actually seems to outrun good in this present age. I'm not sure whether humanity is better off in the 20th century than it was in the first. If you measure all the different problems that confront us today, I am naive enough to believe that the only solution to human's problem, humanity's problem, is the establishment of God's kingdom on earth. And that was the thing that Jesus taught us to pray for every time we pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, where? On earth. A lot of Christians have got the attitude that our aim is to get to heaven. Well, I have to say it's a tremendous privilege to believe that you're going to go to heaven when you die, but that isn't my aim. And it wasn't Paul's aim. Look for a moment in Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 8. Philippians 3, beginning at verse 8. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, 
and count them but rubbish in order that I may, may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. We all say amen to that, don't we? What about the next verse? The next words. And the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, in order that I may get to heaven. Is that what he said? in order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection is our goal, not heaven. When, when we are in heaven, our spirits will be there, but our bodies will be decomposed in the tomb. That's not the end of salvation. Jesus has purchased spirit, soul, and body. And Paul says, I pray that your whole spirit, soul, and body may be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, you can say Paul was naive or Peter was naive. I say no, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit showed them that they'd have that much time and then they'd see the Lord. And while we spend centuries here on earth, they're in a timeless existence. It's hard for the human mind to, to conceive that, but I believe it's established fact. So now, in the light of that, let's go back to Romans 13. Romans 13, verse 11 and following. This do, that is, keep all these instructions, knowing the time, that is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. The night is almost gone, the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day and not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, and not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. That's a picture of people who are living in excited anticipation of the Lord's return. The motivation for holy living is not a set of rules. It's the fact we're going to meet Jesus. 